cut by a certain amount of the food and take it inside the body. Now that I talk about the second point, uh, now that I talk about the second point that consuming parts, pieces or whole food, can you give me an organism or can you give me an example of how we consume whole food? Consumption of whole food in different organisms, example. Consuming part species is easily understood. No, I talk about eating a, uh, eating a uh, part of an apple, piece of an apple, part species, whole food. Uh, do we eat a complete whole food also? Yes. Example? Yes. Grapes, okay. I talk about a big, fee, uh, a big uh, fish uh, consuming a complete small fish at the same time. Or a snake. A snake completely consuming a frog. So, if I talk about such type of an example, this is also known as holozoic mode of nutrition where the organism has the capacity of digesting complex nutrients inside the body. Okay, that is holozoic. What about the second type that we are going to talk about? Biotic. That would be saprophytic, saprozoic or saprophytic. Now, saprozoic or saprophytic, just try to understand the difference. When I talk about saprozoic or saprophytic, what is about the examples let us first of all talk about examples certain category of organisms falling under the group fungi do you know one of the examples of fungi do you know one of the examples i'm talking about this is the category and yeast okay so if i talk about the mold and the mucor and the yeast so all this would come under this category so what is the basic feature to understand they feed on soluble nutrients they feed on soluble nutrients uh, present. They feed on soluble nutrients present in <coughs> the areas where decomposition of organic matter takes place. Decomposition of organic matter. Decomposition of organic matter, organic food takes place. Now, if I give you an example of, again, I already gave you some examples of the fungi. Say, suppose I talk about the mushrooms, I talk about the mold, I talk about the muca. So now in all of these examples, what is common? Is this mold, muca, mushroom, are they feeding on anything complex and getting it digested inside their body? No. So what are they doing? Uh, an animal is getting rotten and getting decomposed. Say, suppose I talk about a, a pigeon getting rotten and getting decomposed. I talk about a frog getting rotten and getting decomposed. I talk about the, uh, the uh, leftover food getting decomposed. I talk about any plant part falling on the land and getting decomposed. If these are the situations, then what is happening? As the process of decomposition happens, there will be adequate amount of fungal growth. Whenever there is decomposition, now fungal growth will happen. But uh, did, the fung did the decomposition happen because of the fungus? No. The decomposition happened because of the bacteria. The decomposition happened because of the bacteria. And now that the process of decomposition happened, the organic matter, which can be the plant parts, which can be the dead animal, which can be the leftover food, because of the chemical substances which are released by the bacteria, these food is getting rotten and decomposed and rotten and decomposed and now, now they are becoming soluble and getting mixed with the water or the soil wherever the process of decomposition is happening. So if it is basically the land or any surface there only we majorly understand the growth of fungi. So just try to understand, just try to uh, remember if at all you have seen uh, the growth of fungi anyway. Did you ever see the growth of fungi anyway? Where? On flower pods, because whenever right. fungal and no, no, decomposition is happening, uh, then there's a foul smell also, we understand. So yes, the growth of the fungus, not that I talk about this uh, desks and the chairs, will there be any fungal growth here? No, because these are dry surfaces. They are dead. dead. Ah, these are dead, dead, dead and on top of this, the environmental condition not, not suitable because it is a dry surface. On a dry surface, the process of decomposition cannot happen. Not so, if you add moisture. Here, yeah, on this, if you now add moisture, then of course you will see the growth of fungus. Now, say, suppose we talk about the monsoon time. When the monsoon time, there is now, say, suppose for our region here, 
four months of rainfall, four <coughs> months of so much of humidity. You open your shoe rack and you get to see here the shoes which you're not using for the last three, four months and getting a white coating, a white covering. Now. The leather bags which are kept inside in your cupboard and not been used for almost five, seven months, they're getting a smell. There's a, there's a typical oh, smell yeah. also, no? So what is happening now? But you will not get to see this now at the season. At the season, there's nothing because the environmental conditions are dry and hot. So hot and dry weather is not at all suitable for decomposition of the fungal growth. So how is this organism taking in the food? Do they have any system of digesting inside? Nothing. They are just taking the soluble nutrients. They are only taking the soluble nutrients from the general surface of the body. Whichever organism I talk about, the mold or the mucor or the yeast, they are just taking the nutrients from their general surface of the body. From their body surface, they don't have any organs for digestion. They, don't, they have no, no structures at all for breakdown of the complex food into the simpler forms. Uh, the third type, if I talk about the third type, you probably know much better. If I talk about parasitic, now the, what about the parasitic mode? Can you tell me one feature of the parasitic mode? Parasitic mode is also quite similar. Like the it there's a there's a host need, needed, no? And how, what can be some of the difference if I understand uh, the parasite? Or uh, if I talk about the parasitic mode of nutrition, uh, certain organisms, certain organisms obtain nourishment. Certain organisms obtain nourishment from a host body. From a host body, either remaining either <coughs> remaining in contact with the external body, remaining in contact with the external body, if that is so, then we will call such type of parasites as ectoparasite. Or entering inside the body of the host. Entering inside the body of the host then in such cases, we will say that such parasites are endoparasites. Now, when I talk about these two types, endoparasites and ectoparasites, then what is happening? I am talking about an association between two organisms. Which two organisms? A parasite and a host. So I am talking about an association. This is the host organism. This is the host organism. Now, this parasite is either remaining attached to the body and taking nourishment from the body. Can you give me one example? Leech. Leeches. The leech is there. We talk about the leech is there. Even the mosquito, why not? We talk about the mosquito, the, be the bed bugs, the lice and the ticks, the fleas. No, bacteria is not a parasite. The bacteria directly <coughs> enters inside our cell and damages our cell. That is not a parasite. So whenever we are talking about such examples, I just now gave you so many examples. The fleas are there, the hair lice is there, the mosquitoes are there, the leeches are there. They will always remain in contact with the outer surface of the body and derive the nourishment. But it is also possible that sometimes <coughs> they enter the body of the host. Now this is the parasite. Sometimes they are entering the body of the host. Sometimes they are entering the body of the host. Can you give me an example? Like if I talk about the tapeworm and the roundworm. Now, say suppose the cattle, the cow and the sheep and the goats, etc. They are constantly grazing on the grasses, the greens, you know. And uh, maybe uh, by, the, uh, by the way of uh, uh, the release of the waste substances, some other infected animal must have released the egg stages. And now that egg enters the body of the animal and develops in the intestine. So what type of a parasitism are we talking about? Endoparasite. Endo meaning inside. Ecto meaning on the outer surface of the body. So what is the common feature that you come across? What is the common thing that you come across between saprophytic and parasitic mode? Mention one common feature and one difference. First of all, let us talk about one common feature. What is the common feature? What is the common feature between saprophytic and parasitic now? They are taking in soluble nutrients from another environment or organism. 
they don't have the capacity of digesting any complex nutrients into simpler form. That is the similarity. Then what is the difference? This group of organism is feeding on dead and decomposing matter or organism, and that is feeding on live organism. We are talking about the host, which is a live organism. Say, suppose I talk about the tape form entering into the body of the cattle. The cattle is still live. The cattle is still living. But still the tape forms are developing in their intestine. I talk about the chicken. I talk about the pigs. I talk about all these organisms. They also may have variety of different type of worms in their intestine. They may have. So now when we are talking about these different type of organisms, they are parasites which are constantly in attachment with the living body. If there is an association between a parasite and a living organism, now we talk about this as parasitism. An association between one organism and the other is dead and decomposing, and that is saprophytic mode. Let us write one question there. Write one similarity and one difference between parasitic. One similarity and one difference between, we'll make a table. Huh? Write one similarity and one difference between parasitic and one similarity and one difference between parasitic and saprophytic mode of nutrition. Difference, one similarity first, saprophytic mode of nutrition. Saprophytic mode of nutrition. Make a table, we'll write down the similarity first. Make a table, write down the similarity first. Yes, ma'am. What is the similarity? They both play. The similarity that we'll write is in both these methods, in both these methods, in both these methods, one organism, one organism is dependent on one organism is dependent on another organism. One organism is dependent on another organism. And and absorbs and absorbs. Ah, in this, what I said, what was the first In both, in both these methods, one organism depends on another organism depends on another organism and absorbs soluble nutrients and and absorbs uh, tell, tell me from where again you missed out one Read, read, what you have written? In both, in both one depends on another organism. <coughs> depends on another organism and absorbs. And absorbs soluble nutrients. Absorbs soluble nutrients. And are not capable of And are not capable of digesting. And are not capable of digesting complex nutrients inside their body. Complex nutrients. And are not capable of digesting complex nutrients inside their body. Did you understand what you wrote? Did you understand what you have written? So in both these methods, what is the similarity? I asked you to write one similarity. What is the similarity? In both these methods, one organism is dependent on the other organism and straight away taking in the soluble nutrients inside the body. In any of these methods, is this organism digesting anything complex? No. And uh, what about the similar this difference now? 
In parasitism, you will write it on your own now. In parasitism, one organism depends on a living host. And in saprophytic mode, one organism depends on a dead and decomposing organism. Liko? Write this concept on your own. Will you be able to write? In parasitic, one organism is dependent on the host. On a living host. And in saprophytic, one organism is dependent on the dead cell. Dead and decomposing organism. Dead and decomposing organism. Living host. If it is parasite, living host. And if it is saprophytic, then dead and decomposing. One organism is dependent on dead and decomposing organism. Dead and decomposed. Dead and decomposing organism. Dead and decomposing organism. Now, when I talk about certain plants. I'm talking about certain plants now. As I look into certain plants, the plants has got leaves, okay? The plants will have various arrangement of leaves here. So what is some special property of these leaves? Now we try to understand the concept of autotrophic nutrition in the plants now. In this concept, if I talk about a leaf, and this particular leaf, I try to find out certain features, I understand that this particular leaf has the property to undergo a process by which it can manufacture its own food. So this particular leaf has got certain special properties. This particular leaf has got certain special properties. Which are some of the special properties? Look into these particular cells, uh, this particular part of the plant, the leaves. These leaves will have <coughs> definite arrangement of cells. Now I talk about certain cells of these plants, of these leaves. What would be one special property that these particular cells have? They will be having an organelle and this particular organelle is known as what? Chloroplast. chloroplast. This, particular pigment, this particular organelle is known as chloroplast. And what does this particular organelle produce? A pigment known as chlorophyll. What is the color of chlorophyll? Green. What is the job of chlorophyll? Absorbing sunlight. Absorbing sunlight. And after absorbing sunlight, what can it do? It can absorb the sunlight and then what? It can trap sunlight and utilize what? Carbon dioxide and water of the environment and ultimately resulting in the formation of food. A process known as photosynthesis. So here we are trying to again come across that these plants have got some special properties known as the presence of plastids, the presence of chlorophyll, and the presence of chlorophyll enables them to manufacture their own food, a concept known as autotrophic nourishment again, autotrophic nutrition again. Let us write down the overall chemical equation of photosynthesis first. What is it? We talk about molecules of water. How many? Six. How many molecules of, uh, I'm sorry, how many molecules of carbon dioxide? Six. How many molecules of water? Surplus amount of water, that is 12 molecules of water in the presence of sunlight and the cell should be having a pigment known as chlorophyll and then they are capable of manufacturing one particular molecule of glucose and what are some of the byproducts that they produce? The byproducts are oxygen and six molecules of water again. So this is the overall chemical equation of photosynthesis that you should always remember. Now, since we are talking about photosynthesis, we are supposed to understand many more aspects of it. First of all, let us try to understand what are some of the raw materials of this process. Here, first of all, we try to come across that what are some of the raw materials of the process. Raw materials means what are some of the pro uh, substances which are necessary. Uh, we talk about the first raw material. What are the raw materials that you can see on the left side of the equation? We talk about the first raw material is carbon dioxide. Can you tell me from where does the plant get the carbon dioxide? From the atmosphere. 
So now, if I talk about that, it gets the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Uh, what type of structures generally help them? What type of structures allow the plants to take in the carbon stomata. dioxide? Stomata. Where are they present? Uh, on the under surface of the leaf, more in number. Otherwise, they are present all over. But when we are talking about what are stomata? Stomata are some small openings that are present on the surface of the leaf. Yes, if I talk about the under surface of the leaf, it always have a higher number. That is what it is. So now that I talk about what are the specialized structures by which the plants take in the carbon dioxide stomata? <coughs> what particular process is involved here? The process that is involved in the taking in of carbon yeah, dioxide is just what? Uh, it's just diffusion. So the process by which the carbon dioxide enters into the leaf, enters into the leaf cells to carry out the process of photosynthesis would be just diffusion. So now, if I am just talking about a particular leaf, I talk about a particular leaf, and then now I try to look into the section of this leaf thing. I try to look into a small portion of the leaf. Then how do I get to see this leaf will basically have cells like this. It will basically have cells like this and then some tall group of cells like this, which are, uh, which has got a definite name that you have to remember now. They have got a definite name, certain arrangement of cells, some few layers of cells now that we talk about. And then after these layers of cells, again, we talk about certain specific arrangement of cells back again. And what are these layers of cells, first of all, now known as? These layers of cells are known as the epidermal cells. And it is always on this epidermal cells, especially on the lower surface. We generally say they are more in number, no? So on the lower surface, we are going to come across some kidney bean shaped cells. And this is what we are talking about as the stomata. The guard cells, a pair of guard cells, resulting in the formation of an opening. And that is what we are talking about as a stomata. Now here, when we are talking about that, the process of diffusion, I told you right now, no, that the carbon dioxide would always enter, the carbon dioxide would always find its way through the stomata and then it reaches the other cells. The carbon dioxide always finds its way this side. But why can you tell me, why does the carbon dioxide move towards the plants, towards the guard cells? Why not from the leaf towards the atmosphere? What should be the reason? Because surrounding the leaf, surrounding the leaf, the carbon dioxide concentration is always much higher as compared to the carbon dioxide concentration inside the leaf cells. So the process of diffusion means what? What is the definition of that word diffusion? Movement of molecules from a region of higher concentration to a region of lower concentration. So that's very simple to remember. Now that we are talking about the surrounding of the leaf, you already know that there are so many reasons for carbon dioxide release, is not so? There are so many reasons for carbon dioxide release at any particular period of time. The carbon dioxide concentration surrounding a plant, surrounding the leaf must be so much. Uh, but how come the plant cells are not having that much? Because the plant cells are constantly utilizing it to prepare food. So at any particular period of time, the plant cells are having much lesser than the surrounding. Hence the process of diffusion. Hence the process of diffusion. So this is one raw material that we talk about, which is very, very necessary for the process of uh, photosynthesis. But now one more thing to also understand that now that I'm talking about diffusion happen in the surrounding, what is the average amount of carbon dioxide always to be there, to be suitable for the process of photosynthesis? As long as the amount of carbon dioxide is something around 0.03% to 0.05%, not a problem at all. But if the percentage of carbon dioxide becomes much higher, much higher, much higher, and almost goes towards 0 0.09, <coughs> roughly around 0.1%, as it moves roughly around 0.1% at that time, is, are we supposed to understand more carbon dioxide, more the rate of photosynthesis? No. After a particular amount of carbon dioxide, when the amount of carbon dioxide is reaching something around 0 0.09, 
roughly around 0.1 percent, जैसे हो जाएगा. That means I'm talking about a place which is extremely polluted. The rate of photosynthesis in the plants are very very low. 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 It's just the opposite. Low. No. In the uh, atmosphere. It's Atmospheric, atmospheric carbon dioxide. If it is much more than this level, this is the most optimum level which allows the process of photosynthesis. After this, carbon dioxide is considered as a pollutant. Which one? Uh, the zero point zero. Ah, this is why I'm telling you is because always, <coughs> if at all this type of a question comes, all these students correlate this. That more the carbon dioxide higher the rate. It is not like that. More the carbon dioxide it is not higher the rate because after a particular level, if it keeps on increasing, the stomata will start closing down. The gut cells will start closing down. So diffusion will not be possible. And if no diffusion, the cells are running short of carbon dioxide and hence a lower rate of photosynthesis. I'll give you certain questions later. So this is one. Property that you understand. So we have been talking about carbon dioxide. What is the second raw material that we have to understand here? The second raw material that we talk about would be water. The second raw material that we talk about is water. Now tell me, how should the plant cell? How should the leaf get the water? Roots. Which part of the plant? Root hairs. Yes, root hairs. Uh, and uh, what process must be involving there? Osmosis, known as osmosis. Now, can you are you aware of the difference between the word osmosis and diffusion? Yeah. What is it? Diffusion. If it is, if we say diffusion is the process of movement of the molecules from a region of high concentration to low concentration, for the root hairs it is also the same. But provided we are talking about now that I am talking about the root hairs. Now this is the plant. And this plant has got a whole lot of root hairs here, and then the water, all surrounding water. So I'm understanding that these water molecules straight away enter the root and then move around and then go inside and then go inside. But how come the water is from the soil? How come the water is entering into the root cells? So, huh? Why? <coughs> There are some reasons. No, why should it enter? Just like this, I told you. The water. Now, if I talk about a small cell of this root, I talk about a small cell. And this water molecule, they are entering inside. Now, this water molecule, they are en entering inside. Why is this water molecule entering inside? Because outside in the soil, the water is less concentrated. And can you remember that the plant cell has got a structure which contains fluid inside? What is that structure called? Big. The plant cell has got the vacuole, and what does the vacuole contain? The sap. So now, this particular root cell, now that I'm talking about, this particular root cell will be having the sap, and the sap is basically known to have higher concentration, higher concentration. So since the sap has high concentration, here it is low concentration, dilute water here, no? It is dilute. So water. Readily moves inside. Water readily moves inside. Goes inside. Goes inside. Goes inside. So now, if I have to understand what is the difference between osmosis and diffusion, what should I say? If it is the movement of molecules of only water from a region of high to low concentration, that is osmosis. Exactly. And if it is a if it is a movement or if it is a movement of molecules of gases, diffusion. If it is a movement of molecules of solute, diffusion, and if it is a movement of molecules of uh, liquid, then also diffusion. Bolo. Ma'am, you said that the cell itself has a higher concentration, right? And water is moving from outside to inside. So here it is going from lower concentration to higher. Kaha pe? Remember the concept of hypertonicity and hypotonicity that you have studied in the ninth. Yes, yeah, studied no. अब देखो, just try to understand what I told you is, this is a particular plant cell. ये एक plant cell है. It has got a sap. This is a vacuole. This vacuole has sap. I am saying the sap is hypertonic. मतलब? Means higher. It has a vacuole. No, in the vacuole, what is the sap? What is the sap? The sap is the water and the minerals and the salts, no? That means that it has a higher concentration. 
So I say that the sap is hypertonic. What, what do you understand by this sap is hypertonic? If the sap is hypertonic, to one of the sap may water come hai, salt zada hai. That is what you understand, no? But if I take one ml of the soil water, it has got low amount of salt and higher amount of water. So ye dilute environment hua na? Dilute, what will, say? What will uh, be the word used for dilute water? Uh, hypotonic. Hypotonic. So I'm going to say that the soil water is hypotonic. This is hypertonic. So what should be the directional movement of the water now? So the water will always move from a region of high concentration. Here water is more. Here the water is less. So the water will always move from a region of low. I am sorry, high, high, high to low. Here the movement is high to low, but diffusion never deals with liquids or fluids. The moment I talk about diffusion, I am sorry, osmosis never deals with gases or solutes. But the moment I talk about diffusion, it can be any of the three. I am burning the incense stick at home. Now, you must also have experienced so many cases of diffusion at home. Can you give me one? A perfume. Your mother cooking in the kitchen, you can smell the food. So all these are examples of diffusion. But when I talk about osmosis, it is strictly associated with fluids, water, basically. Mama, you just said that no, diffusion, no, I'm uh, slip of time. Diffusion deals with all the three molecules. The definition itself is diffusion is molecular movement of substances, all the three. Osmosis only with fluids. Diffusion of diffusion of pasta. 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 Is this understood now? So when I'm talking about water, these are the two raw materials. From where does the plant get it? How does the plant get it? Okay. So now the water get the water plant get by the way of the root hair cells and by the method of osmosis. Now we try understanding the concept of chlorophyll, chloroplast, and about the sugar. So now that we talk about the chlorophyll and the chloroplast, let us try understanding that if I look into any particular plant cells. I understand that these plant cells, each of these plant cells, now there are a name to such type of cells. What are, what are these type of cells known as? You will have to remember this. These cells are known as the mesophyll cells. What are these cells called? Mesophyll cells. What is the property? I am showing you a section of a leaf of a plant. And this leaf has got arrangement of cells, layers of cells. And these group of cells are called what? Mesophyll cells. So what is so special about the mesophyll cells? These mesophyll cells that I'm talking about, they are rich in one particular cell organelle. And this cell organelle that we are talking about is the chloroplast now. Mesophyll cells have got a higher, higher concentration of chloroplast. And if they have got a higher concentration of chloroplast, obviously the rate of photosynthesis is more. Yeah. Again, remember, I talk about the plant. Every cell of the plant undergoes the process of photosynthesis. <coughs> so as it is, we understand if it is the concept of the permanent cells and all there, as it is not undergoing. And on top of that also, the cells of the green parts of the plant, not necessarily every cell is undergoing the process of photosynthesis, the cells which have a higher count of chloroplast. So, which are those cells which have a higher count of chloroplast? So, it is one particular site, name a particular site of photosynthesis in the plant. Green leaves, what is the special property? Cells are mesophyll cells with a large number of chloroplasts. Now, do you remember the structure of the chloroplast? Which in detail, if I ask you, if I talk about the structure of the chloroplast, yes, suppose I talk about the structure of the chloroplast, this chloroplast has some, uh, this uh, coin shaped or disc shaped structures. Do you remember this? They have some coin shaped or disc shaped structures. Either I draw it this way or this way. Remember, it's the same. Your book, you may come across it, your book shown this way. You have a diagram in your book. If you take that diagram, huh? you get that sometimes. So now, 
If I am drawing the section of a chloroplast, it would be something like this. And then I am here showing you the oil like structures. I am now showing you here some disc like structures. And what are these disc like or the coin like structures known as? Uh, but they are all actually connected, they all remain connected like this. So, this is a basic structure, a uh, section of the chloroplast to understand. Certain properties of chloroplast, remember again what we have studied, basic things in the ninth standard is chloroplast is a double wall organelle. It has got some disc like structures. And what are those disc like structures known as? These disc like structures are known as? Yes, studied this? No, you have not come across. This disc like structure <laughs> have got a particular name, and uh, let me name it first as grana. This entire track like structure is a single grana. Okay, not this, I should say this one. This entire track like structure is a grana. But I also want to understand what is this grana made up of? What are these single plate like structures? This single plate like structure is known as a thylakoid. Is known as a thylakoid. What is it? A thylakoid. So look into the section of the chloroplast. You want to ask something? I mean, the grana, the first one is not included. I'm confusing you. I'll try it again. I'm talking about this entire structure is the Grana. The entire stack, every particular chloroplast will have a stack <coughs> of some 10 to 15 plate like structures, disc like structures. So, this entire stack is known as what? Grana. And what are these plate like structures called? The individual plate like structures are called thylakoid. Correct. A group of a bundle of thylakoid is a grana, singular. But if I have to name this, this, this together, I will say grana. Now I will say grana. Then what is the difference? Grana means plural. It is the same thing. So what is a thylakoid? A disc like structure. But why? Singular is grana. You talk about one bundle, grana. You talk about three bundles now in this diagram, I am showing you three bundles, grana. Not two, uh, like multiple words of it. Grana. Plural hogya grana. And singular likna hai to grana. But one plate like structure ko bolenge thylakoid. But why are we talking about thylakoid right now? Because when I look into each of these thylakoid, I get to see that ye jo inner wall of the thylakoid hai. I draw a little bit bigger. That each of this disc like structure. On the inner wall, they are constantly secreting and storing the chlorophyll molecules. So, where are the chlorophyll getting produced? On the inner wall of the thylakoid. <coughs> Simple, the thylakoid is the region where the chlorophyll is produced and stored. You have to remember this word grana for the later part of the chapter. So, we are talking about one region is known as grana, a very important region. And now, there is the matrix. Now, already in the ninth standard also you have studied that when I talk about any particular cell organ, they should be having some gel-like substance inside. No? The gel-like substance inside. What is the gel-like substance of a cell as it is known as? Matrix ya to cytoplasm. Matrix ya to cytoplasm. So, now I am talking about the cytoplasm of the chloroplast. So, chloroplast ke cytoplasm ko kya bolenge? The Chloroplast cytoplasm is known as stroma. Stroma. So now these two words you have to take a note. What are the two words I say? What is grana? What is stroma? What is stroma? Stroma is just the cytoplasmic region, the matrix substance, ground substance. These are all the different names. Ground substance, what the matrix like substance inside the cell organelle. You have studied cell organelle, you have studied that the cytoplasm is matrix cell gel like. Mitochondria also has got some gel like substance. No? The lysosome also has got some gel like substance. So, in any cell organelle, the gel like substance jo present hota hai, usko now we can say matrix ya to stroma. So, for chloroplast, what are the two most important parts that you have to remember? Grana and stroma. Now, 
Why are we talking about grana and stroma? Is because when we look into the entire process of photosynthesis, remember the entire process of photosynthesis involves a whole lot of reactions. We are writing down only the skeletal reaction here, no? The entire process of photosynthesis involves a whole lot of chemical reactions. Some taking place in the grana. And some set of reactions taking place in the stroma. So the set of reactions which are taking place in the grana are to deal with chlorophyll. And they are light dependent. Unless and until there is an intensity of light, these set of reactions will not happen. And another set of reactions or chemical reactions will be taking place any time of the day but they have nothing to do with chlorophyll. They have nothing to do with trapping of the sunlight. So we would say this set of reactions as dark or light independent reactions. So now when I'm talking about the reactions of photosynthesis, the reactions of photosynthesis can be thus grouped under two heads, two phases. So which are the two phases that we are going to study? One would be light reactions or light dependent reactions. What are some of the features about the light dependent reactions to know? If I talk about the first characteristic, what did I say? What are light? What do you understand by light reactions? The entire process of photosynthesis, if it has almost about 25, 30 reactions, some reactions are dependent on light. We'll take two more minutes and finish this. Light reactions are what? Reactions. Of photosynthesis dependent reactions of photosynthesis uh, that takes place that takes place during the daytime only that takes place during the because of the sunlight takes place during the daytime now where does these reactions take place where is the site of these reactions? The site of reactions, what it is? The site of reactions is the grana. The site of reactions is the grana. If it is grana, one more point that you are supposed to understand is, in this type of reactions, we come across that uh, ATP is getting formed during this type of a reaction, okay? So ATP is getting formed. Let us write down some differences. The other side also, then we'll come to this point. Dark reactions. So once you know these two points of the light reactions, very well you are able to differentiate here. Then what should we write for the first point? These reactions take place all throughout the day. Not only in the night, all throughout the day. All throughout the day. All throughout the day. They can happen during the daytime also and the nighttime also. And independent of sunlight, they are independent of sunlight independent of sunlight now when we are talking about the second point of reference we are writing what is the site of reaction we wrote grana what should we write site of reaction the site of reaction is trauma the site of reaction is trauma now let us write the third difference uh, one important reaction is one important reaction is the formation of ATP. Is the formation of ATP. What is ATP? Adenosine, Adenosine triphosphate. Then what do we write this side? One important reaction is there are many steps. We are writing only the basic concept here according to your syllabus. One important reaction is the formation of Glucose is the formation of glucose. Now, again, we are going to understand what happens to glucose. What is the fate of glucose? We will take it up in the next class. This side of the reaction we are yet to study and also certain other features on the light and the dark phase. So for you, you are supposed to understand these three differences only. That in this light reaction, dark reaction, when does it take place? Dependent on sunlight or not? And uh, what is the site of the reaction? And one prominent reaction that happens during the light phase is ATP formation. And the other side, formation of the glucose. Come to the dark reaction, what is the site of reaction? Site of reaction, I said stroma. It's a stroma. Dark reaction is stroma. Always remember, 
Dark creation does not mean that it has to take place only at night. It can take place any any time of the day. Even if the day is gloomy and uh, monsoon season is going on, night, evening, any time of the day, these are the reactions that can go on. But if I talk about light reactions, you know, after a particular intensity of sunlight, maybe at 6 o'clock after sunrise only, the reactions can start. It is like that. Okay? Complete this point. We'll wind up today and again continue the next time. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am.